Greetings. Welcome to, or welcome back to, the Radio Design 101 series. Today's episode is an epilogue to the original series where we designed and built and tested an FM broadcast band receiver. And what we're going to do today is look at the performance of that receiver, because it's one thing to get it done, and it's a whole nother thing to get it working very well. But I want to emphasize that this material is very general. This is not dependent on the Radio Design 101 series receiver, that particular design. Instead, what we're going to be doing in this epilogue is exploring receiver performance in general. So if you haven't seen the previous episodes, don't worry. We can uh, just start here. This is a picture of the radio that we designed and tested in that series. And here's the block diagram, which many of you may recognize as a classic super heterodyne receiver. The FM broadcast band, which in the United States is 87.9 to 107.9 megahertz, comes into the antenna and then goes through some filtering and a low noise amplifier, some more filtering, and then a mixer to down convert it to a lower frequency where it's easier to filter and select a single channel. And then we amplify it a lot and demodulate it, and out comes audio. To do the down conversion, we need what's called the local oscillator. And in the testing that we've done previously, we used a tiny spectrum analyzer in output mode to be that local oscillator. And that's what we're going to use in our test today. And to motivate the technical material presented in this video, what we're going to do is pit our receiver against a couple of commercial receivers. This is a Yaesu VR120. It's a wideband receiver that includes the FM broadcast band. And behind it is an older Patrolman radio that is also a wide coverage receiver. And we're going to look at how our radio performs relative to these other radios. And then ultimately, our goal is to illuminate what makes receivers of any type work well. Now, to quantify what working well means, what we need to do is go through the FM broadcast band and see how many stations we can pick up. And over here on the right-hand side, I've already done that. We'll take a listen here in a moment uh, at just a little bit, but to save time, I wanted to just present the results here. The left-hand column is the RF frequency in the FM broadcast band. These are the frequencies that in my area there are actually stations on, as we'll see. The second column is the local oscillator frequency, which is 10.7 megahertz below this one in order to do the down conversion properly. So this is what I have to set the LO to. And the third column shows how big the signal is in dBm. So minus 43, this is a pretty strong station. This is a very strong station, as we're going to see minus 22 dBm, but there are also some very weak ones around, like minus 70 or minus 80. And a good receiver, like our old radio, can receive all of those. Doesn't matter how strong the station is, uh, it can receive all of them. Ours, not so much. Um, we got one, two, three, four, five stations in very good mode, and then a few others come in quietly. The commercial VR120, the Yesu model over here, uh, which is a wide coverage receiver, it performed about as good as ours. Actually, a little better. I think it got 14 stations. We got 11 after we fixed it. And, but it could get more if we turn on what's called the attenuator in the unit. And then the old radio actually gets 24. So let's take a real quick listen to what our radio does. And then we're going to look at what the VR120 does. And then we're going to go into the main guts of our material today. So let's tune around and see what stations we can pick up. We have the LO coming from the tiny SA set in output mode. And we're at the bottom of the FM dial, 77.2 megahertz. If we had 10 to that, we get 87.9, so that'd be the lowest station. Right now, we don't hear anything, but went up 200 kilohertz, and we hear that. Up one meg, there's something there. Depends on how the antenna's oriented. That's pretty good. Oh, that was another one. 
Very quiet. Let's keep going until we hear a nice strong one. Well, as the Collegians newsletter, website, and social There's a very strong one. Cool. And here's how the commercial Yaesu VR120 performed. Got it tuned to 86.15 megahertz. That's below the FM broadcast band. It's picking up two different stations on top of each other. All right, so let's tune on up and get into the FM band, which starts at about 87.9, I think. Well, there's something there, but there's two stations again. Let's keep on going until we get a very clear one. That's the same station, I think. It appears multiple places on the dial. That's characteristic of modern receivers these days that don't have good pre-select filters. Let's keep it on going. Okay, there we go. There's a real station. So we've already got up to 93.3 FM, and we only picked up maybe one, two stations at the most. We should have gotten a half dozen by now. And that's what we're going to look at in this video. What is causing this? How do we make good receivers? All right, let's get into the main topics today. We're going to review basic receiver design. Then we'll jump into the circuits from Radio Design 101, but not much. So again, if you haven't seen that material, don't worry about it. We're going to look at improving our receiver or any receiver. And then we're going to go into a list of future topics in the series. So here's the challenge that any receiver has to deal with. Coming into the antenna are a number of signals, and these are spectrum plots. The one on the left here is from 0 to 200 megahertz. There are other stations higher in frequency, but we're just plotting 0 to 200. Down at the low end, there are some shortwave broadcast stations. And here in the middle is the FM broadcast band, and most of these are fairly strong. And that's what makes it possible for most radios to work okay. The question is, can they work well? Can they get very weak stations? Like there's a, actually a weak station right here. And relative to this one, it's like six orders of magnitude lower in power. So you have very strong stations. This reads minus 40 dBm. We're going to see in a minute that in uh, my house where I was measuring the radio we designed in uh, 101, um, it was actually getting stations at almost minus 20 dBm. Meanwhile, there can be very weak stations in other parts of the spectrum, like out here is the weather band. And if we look over here on the right-hand side, there's a blow-up of that where we change the resolution bandwidth a little bit so we can pick out the individual ones. And some of these are below 100 dBm signal level. So in a nutshell, receiver design consists of satisfying these requirements. We need to amplify signals that may be very, very weak. We need to filter out what we call interferers, all those other stations, some of which may be very, very strong, that we don't want. There's also noise coming in. And we see that in the picture here. For this spectrum analyzer, the noise floor was about minus 100 and something dBm. It depends on the bandwidth that you're measuring it in. It also depends on the receiver itself. But since it depends on the bandwidth that you're using, we need to limit that bandwidth. That will make less noise in the overall signal that reaches the demodulator section. And we do that, as you'll see, with an IF filter. Finally, we'll demodulate the signal and recover the audio, or these days, probably data. In Radio Design 101 construction, we adopted a classic superheterodyne architecture for our receiver. And that consists, as many of you may know, um, of a pre-select filter, followed by some amplification, followed by another filter. And then we mix down or down convert to a lower frequency. And there we do that final filtering to the bandwidth. But it can't be too narrow. It has to be wide enough for the signal to get through, but not too wide so that too much noise gets through. And in the FM broadcast band, uh, we use 200 kilohertz because that's the bandwidth of the signal. Then we provide a lot more gain after we filtered that signal. We provide a lot more gain so that we can receive those very weak stations and then uh, ultimately demodulate them and do what we will with what comes out. So that, in a nutshell, is the challenge for radio receiver design. How well did we meet that challenge in well, here is the spectrum in my area. 
And this is from 85 megahertz up to 110 megahertz. So it involves the entire FM broadcast band. And you can see a very significant number of stations here. I think it was 20, 25, something like that. The reference level at the top here is minus 10 dBm. So this strongest station is about one division down from that, a little bit more. So it's at minus 22 or minus 23, it says here. Uh, don't get attached to these numbers. Uh, it just depends on the antenna position and other things. This, this will move around quite a bit from maybe minus 25. I've even seen it at minus 10, depending on where I have the antenna. Meanwhile, there are other stations uh, that are very weak. So this is minus 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So there's some stations down here at minus 80 or even less than that. There are stations that could be minus 100 or even minus 110 dBm that we should be able to receive. But we're just going to concentrate on the ones that the spectrum analyzer was able to show because our radio doesn't even get all those. But honestly, the commercial receiver here is not getting a lot of those either, as you can see in this column. So it looks like a simple problem. It looks like we just don't have enough gain in our receiver so that our sensitivity is not good. But as we're going to see, the problem is actually a little bit more complicated than that. In fact, it's uh, centered around this really big signal right here. And it turns out that that really big signal uh, is actually causing problems for this commercial VR120 receiver. In the uh, red circled column shown here, you can see that it also is not getting some of these weak stations down here at the low end, uh, certainly not the minus 80 or even the minus 61 here, unless we turn on what's called the attenuator in here with this button right here. Um, this radio has way too much sensitivity. And I think that's because they designed it for a small antenna, so they just amplified the heck out of what's coming in, and they weren't anticipating a really strong signal like this. When this strong signal appears, it actually ends up blocking a lot of these other stations. So as this slide says, too much sensitivity can be bad. And they resolve that by putting an attenuator setting that you can kick in if you want. Not, not the best solution, but it's a solution. But if you design the receiver right, then you don't have to do that. You can just tune around, like with this old radio, and get virtually every station, except for one. And we're going to look at how we could even get that one, how we can make things work even better than this. Before we do that, however, let's take a quick look at why this station's so strong. This is the tower for the radio station at 96.3 FM. Now, this transmitter is more than a mile away from me. However, uh, it puts out an effective isotropic radiated power of 21 kilowatts by using a six-element vertical array at the top of this antenna tower. That's the cause of a lot of these missing stations here, not just for our receiver, but for the VR120. Even with the VR120 attenuator on, we still have problems. So let's look at what's causing those problems in our radio and by extension in other radios as well. Remember, that's our goal today, not just to fix our radio. Our goal is to understand limitations of receivers in general. All right, so let's take a quick look at the low noise amplifier in our existing design. Here is the detailed circuit diagram that's covered in the Radio Design 101 series. It's not necessary to understand this in detail for what we're talking about today, however, it is important to note that there is some filtering that goes into this input matching network. It does do some pre-selection filtering. And then we amplify the signal, and then there's a filter after that. Question is, how much gain does our low noise amplifier have? Well, it has a nominal 20 dB of gain. And you can see that in the picture down here at the right. This is a nano vector network analyzer. We've got some videos on that on this channel if you're interested. But look at the blue curve here. Also uh, note that this is starting at 50 kilohertz and goes up to 200 megahertz. So essentially 0 to 200 megahertz. Note that it peaks in around the center and that's around 98 megahertz, which is the center of the FM broadcast band. We're slightly off from that, but that's okay. Uh, we have a gain of 19 point 
6 dB, 20 dB or so there. Very peaky in the middle. We still have gain at the low end of the FM broadcast band, but not too much, and also at the upper end. So we can say that the bandwidth is a bit narrow. Unless we were to configure this to make variable capacitor here and make this thing tunable as we tune across the band. So let's look at how that gain in the low noise amplifier plays with the overall gain in the system. Now, I'm not going to go into details on this, but this is the gain distribution that we came up with in the Radio Design 101 series videos. And you'll notice there's 20 dB in the LNA. There's 10 dB here in the mixing and IF filtering section. And then there's a question mark for what is the IF amplifier gain. We decided uh, in those videos that we needed at least 65 dB uh, in the IF amp in order to be able to get the minus 110 dBm signal to get that sensitivity level. The current design, however, implemented only one stage of IF amplifier, but that provides 40 dB of gain, as we'll see. And so the receiver sensitivity should still be a reasonable minus 85 dBm. And if you remember, uh, that's roughly down here at the bottom, so we should get all of these stations. But we're not getting all of those stations. So, what's the problem? Well, there's something called gain compression. If you hit an amplifier with a signal that's too big, then it can't really amplify that signal fully. And what happens is other signals that may be going through that amplifier don't get as much amplification as they should. And from our large minus 22 dBm signal, uh, this can cause issues if it happens either in the LNA or in the mixer, anywhere before this IF filter. So, are we compressing in the LNA? To find out, I took the Nano VNA and used it as a signal generator and fed it into the input of our amplifier, and then took the output of the amplifier and fed that to this tiny SA spectrum analyzer. And I looked at how much bigger the output signal is in dBm than the input signal in dBm. And the input signal was varied in amplitude by taking some attenuators that you can see on the left over here and putting those in line here and then just laboriously going through a whole bunch of values and plotting the results in Excel. And that's what you see in the right-hand side. So the horizontal axis is the input power in dBm. The vertical axis is in the red plot. Uh, it's the output power in dBm. And at minus 28 dBm input signal level, which is right here, we got out about minus 10 dBm, and that's 18 dB difference, so our gain was 18 dB. However, as we continue going up in signal level, there comes a point at which the output does not go up with the input as much as it should. So at this signal level, which looks like about minus 11 or so, the Output should have been here at, what is that, plus 7 or plus 8, but it was a little less than that. And so you calculate the gain, and that uh, it dropped by about 1 dB there. And as we went up further in input signal level, the gain even falls further. And as some of you may know, uh, this is called the 1 dB compression point. So for our amp, the input 1 dB compression point is about minus 11 dBm. And the output referred 1 dB compression point is about plus 7 dBm or thereabouts. What about our signal? Well, our signal is at minus 22 dBm. And that's way down here. And so at that signal level, we are definitely not in compression. We still have full gain. No problem. So we're good here. The LNA is doing okay, even with that big strong signal. However, it has now amplified that signal. Uh, by about 20 dB or so. So what was a minus 22 dBm signal at the antenna is now close to a 0 dBm signal at this point, which is the input to the mixer. And here's our problem. Its input compression point is somewhere around here. Look at the red line. You can see this is the output versus input curve that we talked about on the previous slide, except this is for the mixer. And it looks like it has a 1 dB compression point somewhere around minus 20, minus 22 dBm. But our signal is now at 0 dBm, or close to it. 
And so we're here, and the output signal level from the mixer is 20 dB less than it should be. And so we have a 20 dB gain reduction taking place in this part of the circuit. So instead of plus 10 dB of gain going through this segment of the block diagram, we now have about minus 10 dB. And it's not just us. Uh, the Yesu receiver and many integrated receivers will have these problems as well. Putting the two issues together in our design, the fact that our LNA had a kind of narrow bandwidth and the fact that we're in gain compression, we get this as our result for the actual sensitivity. Remember, even with our reduced IF amplifier gain that we implemented, we should be getting signals around minus 85 dBm. And that means everybody. But because we got 20 dB of gain reduction in the mixer and we have a narrow bandwidth in the LNA, this is our sensitivity level curve. And if you look at it, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five stations that are well above the sensitivity level. A couple more here, one there, but most of these are below it. And that's why we get this result over here on the right. So, what do we do about that? Here's some possible solutions. One thing we could do is attenuate the input signals or decrease the LNA gain. That's effectively what the VR120 receiver does. They allow you to switch in an attenuator and uh, that reduces the gain so that the mixer doesn't get overloaded. However, that comes with a price. It raises what's called the noise figure of the overall receiver, decreasing the sensitivity. It may allow you to get a lot more stations, but you'll still not be able to get the very weak stations. Another solution is maybe replace the mixer, an integrated mixer, with something like a diode ring mixer that has a much higher input compression point or a high power FET design. Um, in order to get these high compression points, you need to consume a lot of power in your active circuit designs. It's also true of the diode ring mixer because you have to drive it with a stronger LO. So this may be okay, but if you're running on batteries, this may not be okay. Another thing that we can do, in fact, we need to do for sure, because we only implemented one of these two amps, is increase the gain in the IF section. So that's what we're going to do first. Before we go to that quick fix, however, uh, let's take a look at another problem that occurs. Here's the IF filter. This is centered at 10.7 megahertz, a span of, what does that say, 2 megahertz. And it's about 200 kilohertz wide. It's a decent filter. But notice there's a maximum attenuation of about 50 dB through this filter. And here's what that means. Let's say that we have the radio tuned to receive this station right here. This is about 60 dB below the strong one. So if we only have 50 dB of rejection, then when we're passing this signal through the filter, this one's still going to rear its ugly head at the output of the filter and be bigger than this one. And that's fundamentally what's at play here for this 98.5 station, uh, which is at minus 80 dBm. Interestingly, even the VR120 can't get that. Uh, and even this old radio can't get that. And there's more filtering in those. So there are some other issues. We're pointing up the most basic ones here today, but as we go through the epilogue series, I think we're going to be able to show some of these other issues as well. And one of them is mixer spurious products. But the real problem is that most radios, almost all radios, do not have good enough pre-select filtering these days. So here's a summary of the possible solutions to this problem. A really good one is to reposition the radio or the antenna. So in my case, um, drive away from where I am and not get that really strong signal. But that, that's not very practical. Uh, however, what is practical is to take the antenna and reorient it or move it around a little bit. And what that'll do is it will decrease this minus 22 dBm signal to maybe minus 30 or minus 40 dBm if we get it just in the right position. And maybe our weak signal will actually get a little stronger if we're lucky. And so that actually works quite well. And that's been done for 100 years. People messing around with the antennas on their TV sets when there were antennas on TV sets. Uh, what we should definitely do in our design is add a second IF filter. And that would be 100 dB of rejection for off-channel signals. And that would be enough. 
However, you do have to be careful with the printed circuit board coupling issues. You may not get 100, but you'll definitely get more than 50 most likely. And then finally, um, it would be much better, as I said, to implement better pre-select filtering. However, why don't they do that? Well, it's because 200 kilohertz bandwidth at 100 megahertz is, in the language of the Radio Design 101 series, a quality factor of how much? Well, remember, Q is F0 divided by the bandwidth, so this would be a Q of 500. And you just can't get that with normal components. You're lucky to get a Q of 100, certainly not 500. However, there's something called regen or regeneration. It's a very old technology from long ago. And we're going to see if we can uh, bring that back and uh, use it to make more narrow filters. Right now, let's take a look at what we did to improve our receiver in the simplest possible way we could. Here's a summary of the bugs in our design. The LNA has a narrow bandwidth, but it's not tunable. It would be better if we could make it tunable, but that's hard, so we're not going to do that right now. Uh, the mixer's overdriven in this service area due to this strong station. Well, that's not just our problem, that's a problem in general, including for the VR120 receiver. That reduces gain. Um, however, we could make that gain up in the IF amp, as we saw. We could also uh, fix this limited off-channel rejection problem by adding a second filter, but that's not our primary problem. Uh, that's not going to get us that many more stations. So what we're going to do is look at the IF amp gain and see if we can make it a little bit better with a simple mod. And I'm going to keep this short because I know that not everybody here is interested in circuit design. And I want to keep our focus on architectural issues of radios. But ultimately, circuits do come into play, as we saw with that quality factor limitation. So anyway, let's just take a real quick look at the IF amplifier that we have in our design. It's got 40 dB of gain at 10.7 megahertz. This is 10.7 megahertz. It's actually centered at 6 point something, and so we need to recenter it. We also obviously want to increase the gain. So how could we do that? Well, we could recenter it by changing the capacitance. Um, so I'm going to delete this capacitor. That should move the center frequency up. I did not calculate exactly how much because that's kind of involved because this inductor resonates with capacitance in Q2 as well as capacitance uh, collector to base capacitance and collector to emitter degenerated by blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, so we're just going to X this off, take it off the circuit, see if we can move the frequency up. We can also improve the gain by taking out this resistor. And we did that, and it was, well, not great. In fact, the receiver lost virtually all sensitivity. I, we couldn't get hardly any stations. I think we got maybe one. So it just broke the receiver. And I've got a video of that, but for time reasons, I'm going to save that for the next video. Basically, what happened was um, I could put my finger on this. This is low-voltage circuitry, so don't do this on a tube amp or anything with high voltage in it. But on this circuit uh, it runs on 5 volts. I just put my finger on here and everything started working again. So um, that leads into the topic of troubleshooting, which we're going to talk about in future videos. All right, so future topics in this epilogue series. The older radio is the best. Why? Remember, it got all these stations with the exception of that one. Well, I've already dropped hints. It has to do with the pre-select filtering. So what are we going to do for our future topics in this series? The next episode, we got to fix our broken receiver. Um, but that's not the point. Just like this video, the point was not, you know, how to make our receiver better. It was how to make any receiver better. And in this case, the point of fixing our broken receiver is to demonstrate techniques in what's called troubleshooting. And this is one of the most valuable skills that an electrical engineer or any engineer can have. In the old days, we used to have electronics that would break and then you'd have to try to find out what went wrong and you would fix it. Nowadays, because stuff is so complicated, that doesn't happen as much anymore. You just replace stuff. But troubleshooting still matters for cases like this. When you're trying to bring up a new design and it doesn't work exactly the way that you were expecting it to, you need to go in and figure out what's going wrong 
and then fix it. This is a skill that cannot be overstated in its importance. So we're going to do that in the next episode. We're going to touch on that. Then in uh, future episodes beyond that, we're going to look at commercial radio designs, other receiver architectures, like what made this radio so much better. And as we do that, we'll touch on some of the classic performance measures, like the 1 dB compression point we met today, uh, an associated thing called the intercept point. Spurious products from mixers, that's very important. Also, the limits to the ideal sensitivity of the receiver. Why was the FM broadcast band uh, minimum signal that we expected to be able to get minus 110 dBm? Why not lower? Another thing we might do an episode on is radio frequency interference. Many of you, if you're ham radio operators, you probably know about this. But a lot of people maybe don't know that switch mode power supplies, they're all over your house. They're in your cable box. They're in just about anything these days. And they generate radio signals that can end up blocking, uh, especially the FM broadcast band. Things below about 500 megahertz can get affected by this. And finally, to make this more fun for the circuit design people out there, um, I want to look at making tracking pre-select filters. And you can buy digitally tuned capacitors these days. Or you could do it with varactor diodes, but I think this might be a little bit easier to implement. So we're going to look at maybe doing that. Making our filter, which remember peaked at 98 megahertz and was kind of narrow, see if we can make it move in frequency when we retune the receiver. So we'll bring in maybe an Arduino and some other things and set up a programmed environment where we can retune the front end of the receiver. And finally, to try to get that high Q will do some regen, which in the modern parlance is called Q enhanced filtering, and see if we can bring that to bear on the basic problem of how do we shield ourselves against very strong signals, but still be able to tune somewhere and pick up a weak signal without burning too much power. That's the fundamental engineering trade-off. All right, so Thank you for watching this, and uh, stay tuned for our troubleshooting episode and some of these other things. Thanks again.